So now we'll talk about laxatives and antidiarrheals. And so as you can see, this is a go lightly, uh, polyethylene glycol 3350. So this is, I mean, I, I, I this is not, this, the picture does not do it justice. This is probably, you know, two and a half, maybe three liters. And so patients who are undergoing uh, colonoscopy prep have to drink this entire thing the night before. And, you know, they would come into the pharmacy and pick this up and, you know, it, uh, I'm smiling just thinking about it, but it's not a fun night. And I don't mean to be crude, but this it's uh, not fun to have to go through this procedure, uh, this process before having your colonoscopy. So uh, sort of to put it very bluntly, when you're constipated, you're backed up goal for the patient is to sort of have a comfortable, and I emphasize comfortable bowel movement. So how can we do this? There are stool softeners like, such as docusate. There are bulk forming agents such as psyllium and methyl cellulose. Osmotic agents, magnesium hydroxide and polyethylene glycol. Stimulant laxatives like senna, bisacodyl, and lubaprostone. And then we have other agents that work in specific ways to, I would say, reverse specific issues. So laxatives. And so I, I just want to make a bit of a distinction between bulk forming and osmotic because as we'll talk about the mechanism of action, they are quite similar, however different. So bulk forming. We have psyllium, which is the main ingredient found in Metamucil, and then we have methyl cellulose. So these are bulk forming. They are soluble fibers. You would uh, uh, mix these two powders into a glass of water and drink them. And so this helps draw water into the gut lumen and then it helps promote peristalsis. Now this is different from um, osmotic laxatives which similarly are non-absorbable sugars that um, so what this is what this is actually doing is it's sort of creating this like gel in your colon which is actually keeping things regular. And I want you to think as, of bulk forming laxatives as sort of maintenance medications, whereas osmotic laxatives, while well, polyethylene glycol in certain cases can be used occasionally, the osmotic laxatives are a little bit more forceful in their actions. They're drawing in lots of water and causing lots of movement in the bowel, whereas the bulk forming you take to stay regular. Water gets drawn in, forms a soluble matrix with these uh, 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 fibers, and it just helps keep things moving. Obviously, if that's happening, you can have a little bit of bloating and gas. So stool softeners or surfactant agents such as docusate. Docusate acts like a detergent and, and emulsifies, and it causes a better interaction between water and stool, and so you are literally making the stool softer. So it's a little bit easier to push out. And I guess the classic example is a lot of our geriatric patients are on this medication to allow them, because most geriatric patients are more dehydrated, and so it allows them to have a softer you know, stool and an easier um, experience and less real Valsalva and pushing. Uh, you know, the side effect, impair fat-soluble vital absorption. That's something that can happen, but for the most part, DocuSeed is very well tolerated. Now, our osmotic laxatives. So as I was talking about with bulk forming, bulk forming keeps you regular. Osmotics are a little bit more forceful. So magnesium, as I talked about before when we talked about peptic ulcer disease, uh, magnesium can cause diarrhea. So it's used to reduce acid in um, some antacids. However, in this case, we're using it for the actual diarrhea effect. And so it can cause a, a massive shift at higher concentrations of water into the colon and help forcibly expel out any um, anything that remains. So it can be used for occasional constipation. However, it's more, more often used with polyethylene glycol, or I should say light polyethylene glycol, for colonic cleansing before colonoscopy. Um, uh, obviously, if we're getting things moving a little bit faster, a little bit, you know, you're going to have some um, gas or some flatus, you're going to have some cramps, and you can actually have hypermagnesemia in patients who are renally impaired because some of that magnesium is absorbed 
and if you are renally impaired, you can have uh, high levels of it. Polyethylene glycol. So these are, whereas magnesium is a sort of a non-absorbable salt mixture, this is a non-absorbable osmotic sugar. And so it comes into the colon, lots of chains and linking, and it draws water in. And it can be used for occasional constipation, but it's primarily used for colonic cleansing before an endoscopy. This drug is very safe. However, if for whatever reason you're using it quite a bit, as you can imagine, when a patient has diarrhea, there are electrolyte fluctuations. So if you're constantly um, cleansing and, and you know having lots of fluid shifts in your colon, you're going to have some electrolyte abnormalities. All right, so now we move to our stimulant laxatives. So we have two here that I want you to know about, Senna and Bisacodyl. So I also want to make note, we're getting to the point in the year where sometimes things that are said in lecture deviate for what deviate from what you would read in first aid or what is tested on step. So when things like that happen, we do try to make note of that because I know I hated it when I learned something one way and then it turned out that it was going to be tested down the line in another way. So we're showing you both of them. So in lecture, we're stimulating the enteric nervous system that's increasing electrolyte and fluid secretion, sort of like a Vibria cholera toxin that's causing more secretion. However, in first aid, we're stimulating the enteric nervous system and we're actually causing in and of itself colonic contraction. Two things I want you to keep in your head. So again, occasional constipation, uh, big side effects, lots of gastric irritation, cramps, and fluid and electrolyte depletion, causing diarrhea, fluid and electrolyte depletion, uh, and cramps because of the actual peristalsis that we're causing to the gastrointestinal tract. It's not the most comfortable feeling in the world. And then lastly, uh, bisacodyl. So Senna is a natural product, but bisacodyl comes in oral and actually suppositories that you can insert per rectum. Um, so now, moving on. Three drugs that are in the stimulant laxative section, but have sort of... Uh, unique mechanisms that I want you to know and I think that it helps understand the drugs a little bit better. So we have lubaprostone. This drug was developed specifically for patients with IBS constipation form, irritable bowel with constipation. This is a type 2 chloride channel stimulator. So thinking back, we're causing sort of an increase in osmotic activity in the colon we have more calcium, we're secreting it in there. That is going to cause water to follow as we have a more uh, uh, a hyperosmotic environment. And because of that, we have an increase in chloride rich fluid secretion and an increased risk, increase of um, fluid secretion and, and there comes diarrhea. So this is a medication that's sort of used for IBS with constipation. It increases fluid secretion and therefore increasing um, movement in the bowels. Next, methyl naltrexone. So we remember that naltrexone is one of our mu antagonists, our opioid antagonist. However, this one has a methyl group attached to it. And so in theory, because of that, it might not cross the blood-brain barrier. <clears throat> and now we have an antagonist at the mu receptor, which causes constipation only in the peripheral, um, you know, the, the peripheral nervous, the, the periphery of your body, not going to the blood-brain barrier. Therefore, we can use this to treat patients with opioid-induced constipation. So the classic example is sort of the, the, the cancer patient who is unfortunately on such high doses of opioids to control for their pain, but um, is having and suffering from constipation. We can give them methyl naltrexone to allow them to, to, to have bowel movements without compromising, um, uh, you know, the pain relief. Um, some side effects, stomach pain, gas, bloating, things that you can expect from going from a constipated to a diarrhea state. Lastly, we have procalpramide. So this is not FDA approved. And sort of my whole thing is uh, drugs that aren't approved in the United States. I don't think they're really going to be tested as much. Personal preference, personal belief. I want you guys to remember for this one, it's a serotonin agonist. We'll talk about later um, serotonin antagonists that we use for nausea. And so the thought here is an agonist that the serotonin 
receptors that occur in the gastrointestinal tract may keep things moving along. It can be used for chronic constipation, and as we know that um, serotonin antagonists and agonists can cause some QT issues, so there are some cardiovascular side effects. However, I would just remember for this drug, know that it's a serotonin agonist. I wouldn't worry too much because, again, as I said, it's not it's not approved by the FDA, so I, I, I don't think there's going to be too much information on it, your test, and let alone on step at all. All right, so some examples of using these drugs to treat patients. So if you, if you have a patient who is having hard stools, you could use an osmotic agent or you could use docusate, a stool softening agent. If you're having a patient who has no peristalsis whatsoever, then we could use a stimulant agent. So uh, just as patients who would come into the pharmacy and ask for over-the-counter advice, somebody who has occasional constipation, you could give them a stimulant laxative like Senna or Bisacodyl. And as I said, Bisacodyl comes by mouth or per rectum. Children with constipation will commonly be given polyethylene glycol, only it's not in that big go lightly jug we talked about. It's sort of in like a, you know, a tiny, tiny little jar, and you take a tiny little cup of it. I want to say, you know, maybe a tablespoon of the uh, powder. And then you mix it with a little bit of water, and you drink that, and you do that every morning, and it keeps you regular. Um, as I made the example before, an elderly patient, a geriatric with hard stool, they could be given docusate because they're not necessarily constipated, they're just dehydrated. And then one of the things I just wanted to get across to you guys, um, the opioid constipation. Now, this isn't the methyl naltrexone, but this is something different. So as you guys all know, opioids cause um, <clears throat> constipation. And this is sort of a mush and push problem. The, con the, the stools are hard and the, your peristalsis is no longer there. So you always need to have a mush and a push component. You always need to have docusate to make it softer and a peristaltic agent like Senna or docusate to keep it moving. In some cases, you can add a third agent like polyethylene glycol. And just a big point I wanted to get across, some physicians will say that patients will become tolerant to the constipating side effects of opioids. That is not the case. You'll never become tolerant to the constipating side effects of opioids. You always need your patients on chronic opioids to be on a, uh, a regimen to make sure they stay, um, to make sure that they are moving and that they do not have an ileus or a complication or a small bowel or something like that. All right, now to focus on a little bit of the antidiarrheals. <clears throat> so we have two here, uh, diphenoxalate and atropine. So diphenoxalate is actually a mu agonist that only works peripherally. However, as I've said before, even though we say it only works peripherally, that's not always the case, and patients can actually take a whole bunch of it to try to get some of the mu opioid effect and to, to get high. Therefore, we put atropine at very, very tiny amounts so that if patients were to try to take more of the drug, they would start feeling some of the side effects or the effects of the atropine, the anticholinergic effects that are very intolerable. So obviously, a side effects are uh, anticholinergic. Uh, uses primarily for traveler's diarrhea or no fever or blood in the stool. So this is what I was getting at before, and this is what we're going to talk about with that question we answered. When are antidiarrheal medications like diphenoxalate and atropine contraindicated? Blood or patient has a fever. So if you have an ulcerative colitis, if you have an acute dysentery, if you have a bacterial enterocolitis, or if you have C. diff, I know this isn't entirely correct, but the way I like to think about it is there is bacteria in your colon that needs that your body is trying to get out. Well, obviously, when you have Vibrio cholera, there is a bacteria that is secreting a toxin that is causing you to, you know, increase uh, your chloride secretion and, and have watery stools. But I like to think of it as your body is trying to get rid of something. And if you stop your body from doing that by giving it an antidiarrheal, you're actually going to build up the problem. So in that child... I think it was tricky because of the wording. They didn't necessarily, they sort of said the kid had a fever. It was tough to discern if the kid had the fever at the time or not, but regardless, fever or blood 
in the stool, you cannot use an antidiarrheal. Because we have the risk of toxic megacolon, which the child eventually developed. Now, on to another drug. This one is my most favorite drug. If you know me, you know I have a little bit of anxieties, a little bit of stomach upset, lopiramide, or um, oh, when I did it the first time, I forgot it again. What is the brand name for lapiramide? It's Imodium. Imodium is the brand name for lapiramide. My favorite drug by far. You ever in a pinch, you're not feeling too hot, lapiramide is it's great. I apologize for that excessive information. So this is also an mu opioid agonist that works peripherally that can be used for diarrhea. Unfortunately, we have cases, I'm sure you've seen in the news, of people going and taking extremely high amounts of the drug because even though we say it acts peripherally, if you take enough of it, it'll cross the blood-brain barrier. Um, side effects include constipation and nausea. As I just said, new reports of patients overdosing on the drug. And as we had said with diphenoxalate and atropine, it should not be used for uh, infectious diarrhea, blood, or fever. Finally, we have bismuth subsalicylate, our Pepto-Bismol, nausea, heartburn, indigestion, upset stomach diarrhea. Go back to the GERD slides if you want to hear more about that, but it can also be used as an anti-diarrheal.